Support for Elwood City Limits is made possible by Facebook. Facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits. Twitter. At ECL Podcast. Email. Elwood City Limits at gmail.com. And by subscribing on iTunes and following us on SoundCloud. Thank you. And, and my free time. Finally, someone let us out of our cage, and time for us is nothing because we're counting no age here on Elwood City Limits. It's the episodic Arthur podcast. No, this is not the Gorilla's Hour as much as you may want it to be. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the podcast. It's been it's been a minute. It's been a minute since we kicked it. Uh, my name is Will Young, and I'm here with my co-host back after a little bit of an absence, Lucas Mancini. We're back at it again. We're unleashed. And funny enough, we uh, last time we got together... Uh, we had not yet decided a new president of the United States. Oh my goodness! Which how 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 a week can change things? You see, we didn't do the podcast that week, and so maybe maybe we are to blame. That's it's all our fault. It really is. And I we mean, got a crosswire. We leading the free world. We needed we needed everybody to listen to Elwood City Limits. Because they needed their Arthur fix, and when they didn't get it, they were all out of sorts. They weren't thinking straight. They were doing all sorts of irresponsible and uh, questionable things. Loopy stuff. That's right. Well, hey, we're back at it again, so hopefully this will never happen again. (laughs) Today we're coming at you with another full-length episode of Arthur, which, of course, you can find on your own dang self. You can uh, type in the episode name to Google and you are likely to find one or two good rips of Arthur. Of course, if you live in America, you can go to pbskids.org and check out these episodes. Or, of course, if you have a region blocker, which is a whole other thing. Today, we are coming at you with Arthur Writes a Story and also Arthur's Lost Dog. So a lot of Arthur right off the bat. Yeah, it's a very Arthur-centric pair. It's it's a it's Arthur's show and it's Arthur's episodes. It's a little bit of a little bit of nepotiz going on here. We'll get into this later, but the title of the second episode in this batch is almost a little bit of a misnomer. Yeah, misnomer. I was going to say that too. That's right. But Arthur's still getting his name in there, making sure that the mar- the 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 word on the marquee says Arthur. So. <laughs> Off we go with Arthur Writes a Story. Of course, best thing you can do is to uh, check out the episodes before we break them down for you. Or, of course, maybe maybe try and sync it up, although I guarantee uh, Arthur's going to finish before we, we do. So we begin Arthur Writes a Story, Arthur Ferris Buellering once again, which, again, is, you know, it's going to be a staple. It's a staple. This uh, episode starts just like the first episode of Lost. It's a super <laughs> close-up <laughs> on Arthur's eye, and then the camera <laughs> zooms out. And this is for no discernible reason. He kind of just does his, you know, mugging for the camera that he usually does and talks right. to us Ferris Bueller style. Yes. But for some reason, it's like a big white eye. And I was like, is this YouTube video cropped incorrectly? Like, why is this so close to his eye? <laughs> it starts on his eye opening and then Arthur's first lines are there's nothing to this writing business <laughs> he's 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 getting cocky again this <laughs> reminded me immediately of Arthur saying that babysitting is the easiest job on earth just like an eight-year-old boy to think that he knows everything about everything there's nothing to this writing business the hubris on display the hubris of icarus uh, over here arthur's trying to write a story that everyone in the class is going to love for a school assignment and then we go to arthur's imagination of what is surely going to happen and this is this is this is a great this is, well this is all kinds of adjectives uh it's ratburn in his imagination reading his paper to which he ascribes the following <laughs> Astounding, stupendous, tremendous. And then he goes on to say, absolutely, positively, indisputably fantastic. Doesn't he describe it as the best thing he's ever read? The best thing he's ever read, and he's read plenty. Yeah, not just the best thing from a student, the best thing he's ever read in his life. And it's a single sheet of paper. You could tell this is a dream because Mr. Ratburn would never use such redundancies. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. It's like Arthur wrote it was the first person to ever think of that uh, that five word story like baby shoes never worn, <laughs> never worn. Yeah, for sale, baby yeah. shoes never worn. So it's like Arthur is some sort of Ernest Hemingway 
times three. Also in the dream, they give it, uh, Mr. Rapper is so excited, he brings it to Mr. Haney. He drags Arthur out of the classroom by his hand. And I just wanted to quickly say, all of these things, you know, astounding, fantastic, all this stuff, this is exactly how I wish everybody would react to every single creative endeavor I <laughs> ever had. This is how I want it to go in my head. And then I realize that it isn't, and then that's why I never do anything creative. So yeah, he drags him to Mr. Haney's office, yes. and then Mr. Haney says, I have to show this to my publisher, which his we... Pu- he has to call his publisher friend. Yeah, his... Pu- oh, so I thought he just said publisher. I didn't know if he said publisher friend, because I thought for a second here we were gleaning a little bit more from the secret life of Mr. <laughs> Haney. Uh, possibly well, he his was publisher a published f- Arthur. Well, uh, Arthur. His- Ar- Arthur. Arthur. Here, there we go. A There's pub- so much Arthurs in this uh, episode. A published Arthur is yeah. what he is because he's got a lineup out the door in the local bookstore with people with copies of his uh, seemingly published uh, paper, poem, whatever it is. <laughs> D.W. interrupts him uh, in the dream and then in real life. She says, I thought you were writing a story. And then Arthur, great delivery here of just, how can I with you bothering me? <laughs> so, Will, yes. it's become clear at this point that this episode is going to be about Arthur trying to write this story for class as yep. an assignment. Mm-hmm. And so have you ever had a written fiction for school? Oh, absolutely. Um, the, I, I can't remember any specific assignments, but once you get to kind of Arthur's age and above, that's when they start to kind of throw these – fantasy story stuff. I remember doing that a lot in like junior high, having mm-hmm. to write stories and like n- and not even like type them up on a computer. I'm talking like writing longhand. Oh, interesting. Like one to th- four, one to five pages. Okay. Even, even make like a cover page and staple it on. Man, longhand with uh, five pages, that's nothing with my big old handwriting, my mm-hmm. big old dyslexia handwriting. Double space that. That's right. You don't even get the red squiggly line. That's right. It's like 16 point. It's not even 12. <laughs> no, absolutely. And it's uh, it's definitely something that would be done. And, of course, Arthur seemingly having to do this on like – well, this reference says later it's a one-page report. Of course, Arthur is determined that everyone will like his story, but first he has to write it. It's the peril of everybody who does something creative is that everybody's going to like it. But first, we have to do it. This is what we say every time before we record this podcast. <laughs> Everybody's definitely going to like it. But we first have to we, do it. First, we have to record it. Once begun, it is half done, mm. as my mom used to Ooh, say. Okay. Hey, I'm going to have to remember that one. That's pretty good, Mama Mancini. So we start off with Arthur and Co. in Ratburn's class, and they are copying down math questions, and they have all kinds of homework to do. And this is, so this is an episode I didn't quite remember, and this one took me off guard because we go from Ratburn's class, and then we cut over to Mrs. Fink's class. Remember, she's fun. So Mrs. Fink is fun. And... Her homework, she's she's sitting on the desk, her legs crossed, and she's got a guitar. Yeah. And she just kind of op- strums an open chord and says, for tonight's homework, find two words that rhyme. And I was like, pulling out my hair. because And, and they're cutting back and forth. It's like Mrs. Fink to Mr. Ratburn. Like, Mr. Ratburn's hard. Mrs. Fink is easy. Their homework styles. But, like, I mentioned this in previous episodes. I would want my kids to have Mr. Ratburn because although he's working them, working them to an early grave, they're going to leave that class smarter than they came in. Mrs. Fink is babying these kids. Um, It's a hilarious juxtaposition. But hey, Mrs. Fink, she's just training the next generation of MCs. They're learning the lesson of rhyme. And that's just as important of any, that's just as, as important as any sort of academia. I don't think this belongs in your typical PS 119 of your <laughs> typical Chicago question mark suburb. And then, of course, one of her idiot kids just says, <laughs> and, and I must say, besides being a Claude, this child also has the perfect, like, whiny child voice because. <laughs> Because he's, he raises his hand, he's like, Mrs. Fink, what if we can only find one word that rhymes? And you just want to smack him. You want to smack him. It's very Ralph Wiggum. It's, it's, it's sub-Ralph Wiggum. This kid bugs me. <laughs> this, whole, this whole affair bugs me. Goodness. And, and then finally, uh, Rapper gives him a long-term project for the end of the week of uh, the open-ended objective of write a story in one page. It can be real it, it can, or something you make up. 
which also a uh, great visual gag where it's like as Ratburn is kind of giving out the homework, he's kind of tossing chalk back and forth between his hands, and he accidentally like throws it in the garbage on the last one. I completely missed that. Oh yeah, no, I thought it was. I thought it was a nice little animation flourish that they put in there as they leave. Uh, Francine and Buster talking about the homework assignment, and Buster actually had a great line that is I totally related to. Now you, I'd say between the two of us, you're probably more the Buster. Be- because I know he's your favorite character, and I think there's a few uh, traits that you share, and I guess I would probably say I'm more of the Arthur. But here, I absolutely same Buster. He says, I like being told what to do. That way you don't have to do so much thinking. And I'm just like, that's how I work. That's how my brain works. And it's interesting because that's really um, indicative of how a lot of people react to creative writing, and I think it represents different schools of thought when it comes to academics as a whole. You know, you're either a left-brained person or a right-brained person. You either like math and how it's rules of absolutes. There's always one right answer and it always makes sense. The rules never change. Or you like English where it's open-ended and you be creative Mm -hmm. and you, you find the answer through creativity. This is essentially that problem, right? Buster, prefer, well, Buster would prefer to do no schoolwork whatsoever, so he's kind of a bad example. But I found a lot of people when I was in high school who really struggled with English thought very differently from me. They didn't like that it was so open-ended. They wanted more direction, whereas I struggled with math, obviously. Because mm, there, because there is only one solution, and there's also ways in between. Because like I have an English degree, but I do appreciate like solid objectives, even within writing where I'm allowed to kind of go where I want with it. I appreciate having kind of boundaries with what I can and can't do. It's for example, it's why I'm not into like video games like Grand Theft Auto. Like where it's like aside from what you, like you can do any sort of mission whenever you want to and it's all kind of open-ended and I just find myself usually drifting aimlessly and I don't stick very long with a lot of like open world games whereas like more linear games where it's like go from point A to point B, like, I can kind of get my head around that a bit more and then kind of work within that structure. So I just kind of, uh, I I understood what Buster said, and I guess I lie somewhere in the middle with the right and left brain. By the way, great Bo Burnham bit. If you look up uh, his comedy special, What, on YouTube, he's got a great song about the left brain and right brain. Oh, interesting. I'll have to look that up. I would definitely recommend, we also hear... openly recommend Bo Burnham on any uh capacity but yes go on we also hear uh two students who were in mrs fig class mrs fig's class discussing their homework assignment oh boy uh and one of them asks what one of them asks what rhymes with a door hinge now no 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 no. so first off uh it's these two wieners who are (laughs) walking ahead of arthur and one of them says spring thing my homework's all done (laughs) (laughs) and you said door hinge but it's Orange. Oh, it's orange. See, I so, was I had already reverse engineered the problem. I know what rhymes with orange. It's door, door hinge. hinge. Kind there, of a slant so, rhyme. So there you go. And then the kid from before who, you know, had that voice that was just so utterly charming <laughs> says, What rhymes with orange? And then it cuts it it's camera pans over to Arthur and he looks at the camera and gives this amazing face of just like <sighs> Just just so much annoyance, and I felt him so much because I hate that kid. Oh, wow. <laughs> Arthur joins the conversation with Buster and Francine. They're on, like, the playground talking about, like, story ideas. Francine talking about how she has so many story ideas, like how she has a story made up about a, a woman that has to give her baby to a troll. And then uh, Arthur and Buster immediately recognize it as Rumpelstiltskin, except uh, in her story, Francine's troll's name is Big Wilma. So I kind of... I, I kind of didn't know what to make of that, of, of like, is this just uh, Francine kind of talking big or, like, what's going on here with this big Wilma kind of thing? I don't know. I feel like Francine's the type who would – she's the type of person where once she was in university, she would look up, like, allessays.com, find an Ooh. essay in Spanish, Google translate it back into English so she could avoid being caught for plagiarism. Ooh. That seems like a Francine gambit. Ooh. So this is sort of the elementary school version where you just take a well-known fable and change all the names and likenesses 
no resemblance to persons living or dead. Let's hope that uh, that, d- that doesn't quite go that far. So Arthur's idea is when he gets home, of course, he's kind of being harangued by D.W., who's not really trying to annoy him. She's just kind of interested in what he has to write. So Arthur decides that he wants to write the story of how he got Pal. And I could tell by the fact that Pal didn't have his collar yet that it's after they got him, but before they got his collar. So it must be like right after Arthur successfully trained him. So at this point, I was starting to wonder because I didn't remember the episode either. So at this point, I was like, is is this going to be a clip show episode? Yeah, yeah. Because they show a few minutes. Well, not really a few minutes, but they show like a minute from the episode where Arthur's first training. Yeah, yeah. And my worry was, okay. so this is what I thought in my head. I was like, is Arthur going to be like, or maybe I'll write about this. And then they show getting a clip my from glasses. It. Yeah, exactly. So that was my worry. Luckily, this episode wasn't quite like that. Uh, but that, at this point, I was like, oh, you weren't man. sure where it was going. Uh, to, so Arthur says this and DW says, that's not a story. It's just a weird thing that happened, <laughs> which is like I have the same feeling when. You know, when you and I are doing something for the radio and it's just like, you know, draw from real life. And it's like, I don't have any stories to tell. Just weird things happen in my life. They're not stories. So I I, I understand where DW's come from. Oh, by the way, uh, I know that you may be playing the Elwood City Limits drinking game at home, which, of course, will probably be, hopefully, be one of our lasting legacies from this show. <laughs> uh, but also take a shot if you're watching this episode and Arthur says the phrase, best story in the class. Oh my goodness! It won't. It, you know what? It won't get you drunk, but it'll get you started. <laughs> I, I have a note here that says flashbacks to six episodes ago. Like they immediately go into about a minute from Arthur's pet business, and this is where, I, like, I knew that it wasn't a. It, I knew it wasn't a, a clip show, but at the same time, I was like, oh man, this is really bleeding out the clock here on your episode. Just going right back to the episode. I mean, hey, fine, fine, I guess, but it it does kind of. Uh, ra- like just kind of raise your suspicion immediately. Well, they also they don't reanimate anything. It literally is just footage from yeah. that other episode. Mm-hmm. I mean, although to be fair, why would you reanimate it? That would just be a lot of trouble. Uh, but yeah, it's six and one half dozen of the other. DW says, "Does it have to be about your life? Because your life is so dull." Now, like, does, does she say your life, or does she say, "Does it have to be real life? Because your life is so dull." Yeah, I, I guess it's something to that effect. Yeah, and. I thought it was interesting of, like, she says, like, that's such a boring story, and then, like, your life is so dull. And I wondered if maybe that was maybe echoing criticism that perhaps the showrunners faced when they wanted to – like, I don't know. This is this is completely speculation, but it just kind of seemed like what, you're, what DW is kind of making fun of was, like, a – cornerstone episode of Arthur. It's like how he, it's like a big part of Arthur's story. And like the show itself is about Arthur's life. And I just thought it was funny that DW was like, your life is so dull. What an interesting meta narrative because that's been one of my main criticisms is some of the Arthur focused episodes have been more tame and more plain. By the numbers. Uh, and especially compared to some of the more outlandish episodes focused on the other characters. Yes. So that's such a uh, – I'd like to think that because that's so self-aware and and maybe it fits almost too perfect. And maybe just and maybe this whole episode can be framed as maybe a bit of a shot at people who are like, you know, when they wanted to develop the Arthur show and maybe any resistance they found of just like I don't know if this is interesting enough for kids. They kind of as the episode goes on, they embellish the story and they embellish it the story about Arthur getting pal to the point where it's not anything anymore. And so I, it's just kind of interesting to think about. And it's one of those – I wish that I could kind of – I could talk to the people who made this. And maybe we will someday. But, hey, anything could happen. But also, you know, I doubt it. You know what they say. Uh, a movie is an incredible day in a regular person's life. And mm. a television show is a regular day hey. – uh, a regular day in an incredible, an incredible life? person's life. Exactly. Mm. So I, I've actually never heard that. That's good. I think uh, Arthur is certainly an example of the latter. Yes. Uh, once you take all of his life experiences en mass, it surely is incredible. He's had a heck of a life, and he's only eight years old. <laughs> so exactly. Hard to live up to. So at this point, uh, DW says, if that story had been about an elephant, then that would have been an interesting story. And then we get the kind of 
theme of where the rest of the episode goes is that Arthur slips back and forth into uh, just his imagination as he continues to build upon his original story. So the first way he does that is by going back to... Because it's the same clip from Arthur's pet business where, like, Mrs. Wood comes in, they think that they've lost Perky, then they find her, and she actually had puppies, and that's why she was so mean. And then he gets pal from, from that. The first way they do it, and I thought this was really interesting because it's that same scene, except this time it is completely, it's reanimated, it's reshot, and it's made to be much more dramatic. And also, it seems like it was storyboarded by someone completely different than was working on the actual episode. Like, it looks like they got another team to work on this flashback to make it a bit more dynamic Mm -hmm. because the animation immediately looks a bit more flowing and vibrant and, like, kind of in your face a little bit more. So, and and I I thought it was funny. It's just like this overly like the soap opera dramatics of just mrs wood arthur lost your pets and like my poor helpless little baby and then (laughs) arthur says look she had puppies and then elephants come crashing through the roof elephant puppies so and I thought that was I thought that was funny. I agree totally. And Mrs. Wood is already over dramatic in the first place. Yes. So to turn that up another notch is all that more. It, they took that exact same scene and then they just redid it to make it basically a soap opera with elephants, of course. And I thought that that was a really nice touch. And then of course it gets way weirder as we go on. Speaking of weird, Arthur keeps changing it because he's reading it to different people. The first person he reads it to after DW is Buster, who thinks it's okay, but tells Arthur that he's writing a space story. All the best stories take place in outer space. So the next thing Arthur adds to it is that he puts it on the moon or a different planet. This this imagination sequence is weirdly Lynchian in a way because you have, like, just follow me on this. Uh, You have your Lovecraft stuff. Let me get into Lynch here. So Mrs. Wood, like, bounces into, like, she's in a space suit and she bounces into, like, this... Basically, what looks like the Epcot Center, where which is the Reed House, and then DW floats into frame, and they speak in this weirdly stilted fashion. Just Mrs. Wood, <laughs> Arthur lost your pet, and there's this whole gag of like Mrs. Wood spinning in a circular motion, but over tea kettle as she's saying, and she's like, "My poor helpless little baby," and then Arthur comes in, and it's like, "There's Perky, and she had puppies, elephant puppies," and so. The weird visuals, the strange music, the stilted way that they were talking, it reminded me of something like out of Twin Peaks or Mulholland Drive. It's just off to the point where your brain notices that something's not right. No, I totally agree, actually. In fact, I wrote down uh, that this... As levels of abstraction get added to Arthur's original story, and it gets more and more outlandish, but it still has the same skeleton, the same Uh basic plot holding it together, I wrote down that it does get downright Lynchian. Or even, I compare it to, if you've ever read the novel Naked Lunch or saw the James Woods movie. I'm familiar with it. uh, it. It's like, if you barrel down, there is a pretty much a very simple story to this. Oh, Arthur, it's it's the exact same story as, as Arthur's pet business. Yes. But there's all these extra layers of abstraction added with these eventually spotted elephants and all these mm. visuals. Mm-hmm. And that's also interesting that you say about the stilted dialogue because that is a very Lynchian quality, the, almost the uncanny valley yes. of this episode. Yeah, absolutely. So glad, we, glad that we kind of saw that. So it turns into this weird space story. Mrs. Wood, Arthur lost your pet. What? Perky? My poor helpless little baby is out in the world alone and unprotected. Arthur reads it to the brain who finds that it isn't scientifically accurate and that a story needs good solid research. And we find brain as he's like doing some sort of paper on like the similarities between frogs and dinosaurs of the Mesozoic era, I think it is. And, like, he holds up the frog. <laughs> Again, apparently this frog is just loaded with brain's opinion because, you know, it's like you didn't like it, and then he just holds up the frog and it goes, rotten. Rotten. <laughs> There's – whenever um, the writers have to use a, you know, non-self-aware animal in Arthur, frogs often their go-to. Like, yeah. frogs play a part in a surprisingly a lot of Arthur visual or uh, just gags. Spoilers. 
big in the next episode. Ooh. As we've already kind of talked about, Arthur at this point is pretty much writing by committee and just like getting all of these ideas that don't mesh and trying to make something out of it because it's it, – well, and it's the whole point of the episode is that he's writing for everybody else when he should be writing for himself. And, you know, you can kind of see this as an adult and it's just coming together this whole thing. Like the next scene is that we catch Arthur kind of like – spinning ideas around in his head out loud and he's like saying all this weird stuff he's just like i was in another planet no another galaxy tram class yeah <laughs> i remember when i was little i thought that i thought he was saying drama class oh but it's like th- he's talking about a uh, made up planet called tram class oh and it's just like uh, it j- he's just kind of his brain's starting to boil or something. And he's like outside the sugar bowl and Mr. Haney accidentally gets locked into Arthur's bike chain. And Arthur's just like, sorry, sir. I was thinking about blue elephants. And Mr. Haney has a great line of just, why didn't I become a tree surgeon like my mother wanted? I love this. It's another look into Mr. Haney's backstory. What's a tree surgeon? A tree surgeon is someone who, so sometimes trees will get unwieldy with the way they grow. So roots will grow out and they'll start to grow into power lines or they'll start to grow into another tree and start to kill and strangle that other tree. I didn't think think that this uh, was real. Yeah, it's an arborist. So a tree wow. surgeon is someone who will uh, cut um, branches from a tree or sometimes, and this is crazy because we've had it done with trees in my backyard, uh, they can do tree transplants where they'll sort of put splints Trees on. Trees plants? Uh, exactly, where they'll put splints on, which is kind of morbid when you think about it because the splints are made out of other dead trees, uh, on this tree arm to basically have it grow into the tree. And so the tree grows a new arm, essentially, like a Franken tree. I, did, I, I, I honestly just thought it's just a fake job that they made up. I thought they were just like, hey, what sounds funny? <laughs> tree surgeon. Thanks. You know, I, I really just thought it was made up. But Art- we get another little look into Mr. Haney's yeah. backstory. I want this, like, Frasier, Mr. Haney spinoff show. <laughs> He's quickly becoming, even surpassing Mr. Rappern as the adult I'm most curious about in the Arthur universe. I feel like we have so much to learn about Mr. Haney. He's definitely a mystery. And I think may- I feel like some of that appeal may be taken away if he had his own show and you kind of knew too much about him. I think he's... I think he's best kept in the shadows. Great line here by Arthur when he's back at his house. He's just kind of, again, muttering to himself of just, invisible elephants? Too obvious. <laughs> and then he accidentally leaves his clothes in the freezer. And just because his mind is all over the place because he's trying to make sense of everything that pe- people are telling him. The next people he takes it to are the tough customers. Well, before we get to this, um, yeah. his parents are kind of weirded out that he leaves his clothes in the freezer. Yes. I think his dad says something about, like, is that what kids are doing these days? Yeah. But we have evidence of Arthur doing this before when there was the episode where it was too hot outside. That's right. Before they went to the beach, Arthur put his shorts in the freezer to cool off. That's right. So it's not that out of the ordinary. The next people that Arthur talks to are the tough customers. It's Binky, Rattles, and the... Dog one. I don't know if he has a name. <laughs> so surprisingly, of course, they a Binky says it needs a love story. So yet another thing that Arthur has to try and cram in there. And we get this 10-second stretch of really weird imagery because when Arthur tries to add the love story, it goes back to uh, Mrs. Wood in the space suit, and she's just floating in midair going, kiss me, you fool. <laughs> And then we cut to, like, the edit out of this scene is Arthur ripping the paper apart. <laughs> and it's like, like he's, for a second, it's like he's ripping Mrs. Wood apart. And then he just says, he's in the library, and he says, I can't do it. And then three people go, like, simultaneously go, shh to him, and they, like, blow a gust of wind his way. It's like this 10 seconds of just really strange imagery, and it's like, that's the real life. Like, why is Arthur getting, like, blown by a fan? Again, also, it's very Mulholland Drive, like you said, where it's like, wh- what's the story? And what's what's Arthur's reality? The story's bleeding out. It's probably not like that. But this uh, – Pinky, big Nicholas Sparks fan yeah. as it happens. Um, and, again, this point, we it, the moral's really clear to this episode. It's um, to a lesser extent – don't write by committee because eventually you'll lose the plot and you should really write for you. Yes. But at a macro level, the moral of the story is 
you know, be yourself. Don't try and please others yeah. with what you output. And again, it's the second Arthur episode that I think has predicted the folly that is Suicide Squad. Earlier, we talked about Jared Leto's antics. Sure. This time, it's, you know, don't direct by committee or else you'll lose any sort of artistic vision. There's lots of movies, but sure, I don't, <laughs> mi- I don't mind giving one more shot at Suicide Squad while it's still in, in vogue. Uh, so at this point, Arthur's hitting the soda hard. <laughs> he's, at the sh- he's at the Sugar Bowl with friends, and he's had like nine of them. He is going to have to rock a wicked squirt in a couple of minutes. Like, and he's hiccuping at this point. Uh, I love when that show does this where it's sort of – because it's such a trope, right? When a character's down on their luck, you find them at the bar. They're surrounded by all these empty glasses. And the show uses that image a lot, but it's always the sugar bowl. It's always with sodas. Or like milkshakes or yeah. something. So they're talking with uh, Francine Buster and Arthur talking with Prunella who says that – in her year when she had Mr. Ratburn, um, the kid who won wrote a country song, and it turned out it was Prunella. So she was really just, like, on the down low bragging about herself and then, of course, revealed it. So, you know, great job. Uh, so she wrote a country song and got an A+. Plus, and, so the, and so then we kind of see it all come together because oh, Arthur's, yeah. Arthur's final vision is a country song combining space and... Elephants, um, polka dots. Yeah, all of that's all of that stuff, and the, not really the not really the whole love story thing. But maybe Arthur just kind of ixnade that. He also kind of gets rid of the scientific uh, basing it in scientific fact. Yeah. Like this is quite outside the bounds of reality. That's, I'd say that's right. Oh, uh, sorry, completely forgot. Uh, in terms of brains, scientific contribution because he says it needs to have good hard research. It's Arthur at the library. Saying like I love my pet, like blah 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 of the of the genera this like yeah, this so genus. Francine immediately ixnays that, so Arthur knows not to go with that one. So Arthur's country song, it's called. It gets its own like much music three title. Like <laughs> it's the title, it's the it's the uh, artist, and it's the record label. Yeah. So it's it the song is called Planet Schmelefin. <laughs> To rhyme with elephant, it's by Arthur, and it's from Desperate Records. Seems like Arthur should have took Mrs. Fink's class because Schmelephant, not a word. Yeah. But he could have found a different rhyme with elephant. Um, this song's so dope. Rapper's not, rapper's not teaching these bars. Dope, you say. Oh, yeah. Yo, this song, I would hop onto Dat Piff so quickly to download this track. You know Lucas is about to ramp up when you hear, this when is, hear him say yo. This is straight, straight fire. Somebody called it a fire department because you, Arthur you, is about to set Elwood City ablaze you and with I, the bars he drops on this song. Now you, you and I, we work closely with a country format. So compared to the country music that you've heard so far, like how does this how does this rank? It's very country by way of Kid Rock. It's very it's more like cowboy. How do you figure? It's more like the song Cowboy than Ki- by Kid Rock than it is like any sort of Garth Brooks tune. You know what I mean? It's definitely the new school of country music in terms of instrumentation. Like you're not hearing a lot of, of course, because Arthur writers don't use a lot of uh, art. The show producers don't use a lot of acoustics when they put together the Arthur soundtrack. So it's a lot of like synthesized banjo in the instrumentation so I think it's definitely the new school of country but it does sort of have this like it's like a a, 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 how do I describe it it's like a psychedelic twang to it you know what I mean it very as much in terms of the rhyme scheme sort of this like twangy old country Mm -hmm. song you hear that synthesized banjo in the background I'll, I'll tell you I found myself humming it after this episode was I, over. It is catchy. I just I, I I realize whenever I talk to you about music, I do not know as much as you because it's just it sounds like a complete friggin' mess. It's it, I mean it, it is. It's that's kind of what it's supposed to be. It's just I mean it's it's not a bad little. Did you write down the lyrics? Little, but, well, I no, to. But, no, but of course I can remember it. It's you know what I'm gonna here. I'll I'll put the, I'll put the song here and then I'll give you the lyrics. Now this little boy can go home. Yeehaw! And you will see how happy he will be. 
Now, this little boy can go home and enjoy his own personal striped elephant, and you will see how happy he can be here on planet Schmelfin. And, of course, Arthur is reading this for Grandma Thora, who gives him, like, a... Who gives him applause and seems to be very genuine about it. Arthur is kind of uh, sp- spurned on by this. He uh, he thinks that he finally got it. And then he asks again, did you like it? And Grandma Thor says, it was confusing, but you did it, so I loved it. And then that, and then Arthur kind of scraps it because he realizes like it's confusing so good think, for grandma thora though she let she him does, down she, she let him down as easy as possible and she does say you should write it however you want it to which arthur's still stuck on like he still wants everybody to like it now this is probably where in a typical arthur episode you would see arthur maybe working on this more and then being like you know what i can't do this i'm just gonna write my story and it may like no like nobody's gonna like it but i'm gonna put it out there anyway no he goes with the song. He sings the song in front of people. In front of his peers. And what's even... What's and not only that, he's doing an a cappella version. Like, his peers yeah, don't get to see yeah, the yeah. VH1-style music video no, that we no. saw. It's, it's literally oh, just him singing it. Oh, my oh my God. And the, and, the, and the biggest surprise of all is that nobody laughs in his face, which they have every right to do. In fact, the only response that Arthur gets after he goes with the song is Binky, who said, who asked, did this really happen? <laughs> uh, to which Arthur's just like, well, no, it actually started out as the story of how I got my dog. And I like Miss Rapper just like, it did. <laughs> A to B does not exactly does not exactly meet, and so then Ratburn gives the the lesson: don't worry about what other people want. Write the way it means the most to you, which is good 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 words to live by, and certainly very true. So Arthur, we go back to file footage of uh, Arthur's pet business of the act what actually happened, and then it ends with Arthur getting pal, and there's this beautiful, this absolutely beautiful sweeping shot of Arthur in on like a hilltop set against the mountains, this awesome Michael Bay revolving camera shot of him and pal, just like the most in love you've ever seen a boy be with anything. That's so funny. You, It is totally the Michael Bay shot. This just got real. Like yeah. camera sweeping absolutely. around. Absolutely. That's the first thing I thought What's of. weird about it, though, is it... it it barely shows up. Like, it shows up for, like, half... A, I feel like it fades a little bit too quickly. Yeah, it's not there like for it, very long. It doesn't even get through a full rotation, I don't think. No, and then it no, goes no. Away. In the end, Ratburn gives him a sticker, asks that he write that story down and pass it into him. <laughs> and then Binky says, did that really happen? And Arth, and Arth says, yeah. And then Binky says, cool. It's not the not the most uh, wham, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, end to the episode. But, uh, you know, it's... It does its job. At least Arthur didn't get an A-plus for that. Uh, so, no, uh, I wasn't able to find now word from us kids for this one. So. Oh, I did. Uh, oh, so. cool. And now, word from us kids. Uh, the kids were essentially, they were all writing creative writing stories about their um, houses. Most of them were about, like, their families. One girl talked about how when she grew up. She was going to get an apartment with a dog and all this stuff. So it was essentially kids telling their own um, fiction or nonfiction stories for creative writing class. They drew pictures as well. There's only two really things of note that stood out to me that we're, okay. uh, we're talking about. Again, the music sounds like it's straight out of Donkey Kong 64. Uh, not Donkey <laughs> Kong 64, just like early Donkey Kong music, like SNES, like dun, 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 dun. Uh, I don't know if this was just in vogue back in the 90s. It must have been because sometimes I close my eyes and I'm like, this has to just be Donkey Kong music. <laughs> The other thing is some of the kids write their stories by hand and some of the kids write their stories on this big old gray early 90s PC that I oh. love seeing. This Commodore 64 the, looking fat the, PC. This word processor. Oh, yeah, baby. And you, I just loved seeing one of those. So big. You could play maybe a vector game on it. Yeah, Load maybe, Runner. Maybe Solitaire. Some Apple II Load Runner. It was holler at you. That's right. But that was essentially it for a word from us kids. Okay. And now, back to Arthur. And we get into the second half of the episode. It is Arthur's Lost Dog. And the cold open for this one is uh, DW still not impressed with... With my boy, with my boy pal, uh, pal has the collar on him now, so he has been with the Reed family for at least a, a substantial amount of time. 
Uh, so she's trying to get Pal to do a trick and, like, trying to get him to do a trick for a treat, basically. But the the whole thing is, basic, is basically DW, you know, asks him to, like, roll over or sit up or something. He doesn't do anything. And then he immediately goes to the box for a treat. Because she's very low to the ground. So yeah, she just, yeah she's just kind of keeping it, like, dragging it behind her so that the... Uh, it's it's open and so Powell's just taking advantage and uh, there's not there's not much there's not much to this honestly but I I think it's I think it's adorable. DW has a f- amazing line here Which where she goes she goes just look at his eyes Arthur this is not a smart dog yeah which is such a sick burn for this port like I I I make fun of my own dog a lot yes. because he's very pretty but I used to say. He's not the sharpest dog in the knife drawer. Uh, he's kind of got a dumb look on his face all the time. He kind of looks at you like <laughs> big old goofy smile. <laughs> Walks around the house searching room for room to see if there's food. No matter how many times he checks, the food doesn't show up. Sure. But so this is – I'm going to have to keep this one if I'm ever to trying to burn my dog. <laughs> I'll keep this one in my back pocket. This is try, just trying to roast your own pooch there. Yeah. The story takes place uh, on downtown day in Elwood City where the streets are blocked off for a big uh, local celebration. Kind of reminded me of when word on the street used to be downtown – uh, where we live in Nova Scotia. Do you remember, were, were you ever old enough to go to Word on the Street? I, I've only gone to like an indoor Word on the okay. Street. So when I was when I was younger, uh, Word on the Street, which is a like outdoor festival that was all about literacy. There was like the library would have stuff there. There would be like bookstores and local authors and publishing houses. And I met, I, I met Steve McNiven, uh, pencil. Uh, Artist of the Civil War comic books, yeah, now yeah. an incredibly successful film, and old old uh, man old man Logan, which uh, will be right, an incredibly he, successful film next year. And he is a uh, well, he used to be a Halifax native, and mm. so I met Steve McNiven. I got him to sign my Civil War comics at a uh, word on the street one, way back in the day. One of my favorite artists. Well, I met Spot the Dog. Ooh, like Spot the Dog. Spot the Dog. We, he, was, he was on the street. You know, it was somebody in a costume when I was like seven years old. But it was the best thing ever. Like they would have mascots out and like one of them was Spot. And it just like, like it's, it's Spot the Dog. This is awesome. And, like I gave him a hug and then I saw him later and I ran up to him and gave him another hug. It was great. I love Spot. Like cute Cute cartoon dogs. That those are my favorite kind of dogs. <laughs> I can tell, especially gold, especially like golden retrievers or whatever the whatever the heck spot was. Anyway, so downtown day in Elwood City, we actually do something similar here in uh, in Halifax, where it's like it's like an entrepreneurial day where they'll block off streets and then there'll be all these vendors and stuff. It, it, it's 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 similar to any sort of festival. Or like if you've seen the episode of Seinfeld where they have that festival and it blocks off traffic and mm-hmm. um, there's all kind of all kinds of things like this in major metropolitan yeah, areas for sure. from time to time. There's a table that they pass by where it's a mouse who says, guess how many pickles win valuable cheese? <laughs> I wondered if maybe it's a little stereotypical to associate a mouse with cheese. I just thought it was weird that like you guess the pickles, but you win the cheese. Like why not just guess the pickles to win the giant jar of pickles? You know what I mean? I, I, would, I, I wouldn't want to – well, I don't want to want to try. No, because, d- dude, dude, think about it. Where are you going to put those pickles? That- they never go bad. That's the whole point. That's why they're um, – Pickled? Yeah, that's why they're pickled. They never go bad. Okay. I'd, I could I could be eating pickles for the rest of my darn life. I'll put it in a closet somewhere. I go they- down to the old pickle barrel right, whenever my, I'm fiending right. for a pickle. <laughs> The old pickle barrel. I my apologies. I assumed you had to refrigerate pickles, but then again, they're not refrigerated when you buy them in the, in the market. So I don't know. Good question, but I wouldn't mind some valuable. You're chances. right. I think I think you do have to refrigerate them. I don't after you, after uh, you open after you open it. Yeah. So once you break the seal, then you have to refrigerate. And then them. you have to eat, and then you're gonna have to eat that big old pickle in one go. So you better be hungry and in the mood for a pickle. Well, maybe if you have a pregnant wife, you guess that she. But guess the pickles win the pickles. It's uh, it's not uh, not playing to a lot of people's uh, desires here, but I would be in for cheese. He also says he says win valuable cheese. Valuable. Cheese. <laughs> this ain't some cheap American like KD Kraft singles. No, he, this is some prime primo gouda. He got it. He like he got it imported from like France, where like there's <sighs> there's no laws on like pasteurization, <laughs> so it's like real fat, buttery cheese. Maybe I don't know. Uh, they go by. 
the first appearance of Jack's Joke Shop, who is handing out free jokes, which, you know. Did you write it down? I didn't write this down. It was, what do you get when you combine an elephant, or like peanut butter and an elephant? What do you get, Will? An elephant that sticks to the roof of your mouth. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> and then he has this, he has this. He has this real flourish to the end of the joke that's just like, this joke was bad, but now here I'm going to do stuff. Like he bangs his head on a little gong, and he puts a fish down his pants. I, I do like that. I do like that added, like, just – all he's missing is, like, throwing some streamers from out of his suit jacket, like, shrugging his shoulders. Yeah. I can't get no respect. No respect. He'd like It's like, hey, you didn't like the joke? Well, here's a fish down the pants. Yeah. Like, I guess he's trying. Open up a can of peanuts as a <laughs> snake comes out. He's just hey! – See, now he is joking by committee. He's trying to do too much, and he's not impressing anybody. Jack's Joke Shop, 0-1. <laughs> Jack's Joke Shop really took an L on that one. <laughs> so we get a cute little shot of Pal and Kate, who, like, Kate's kind of uh, petting Pal. And it's it's just, I just, I like to see because I'm always super nervous of, like, dogs around babies. Like, you see those cute viral videos of, like, oh, here's this huge dog and, you know, this tiny baby. And they're, like, best friends. And, I'm like, that's cute, but that's, like, one out of ten times. Like You think? Well, there was a – I remember – I think it was earlier this year, and I won't get into specifics, but, yeah. like, there was a story about a, a dog who – and a baby who that made the news, and it was not – dog was not kind to that baby. Now, I would say that the reason that made the news is because that would be the exception rather than the rule. Flip your analogy on its head. Rather than one in ten times, I think, Will, in my experience – and I've met a lot of dogs and a lot of babies – it's – the dogs are comfortable with the babies more often than not. I'm not saying I'm not saying you're wrong, and obviously I have no idea, but I just always get just a little bit nervous. Like if you're introducing a dog to a baby, like you have to kind of like if they live together and they're cool, like that's fine. Which obviously is what's happening with Pal and Kate, and I think that that's very cute. I'm just trying to say it's cute. It's I get funny. what you mean, though. It's a communication thing. You can't exactly ask a dog and a baby what they think about each other. But mm. that also kind of leads into the moral of well, not the moral, but the theme of this episode. Uh, they they have to be they have to be well trained dogs. So Pickles the clown is uh, giving out free balloons, and Kate sees the balloon. Now this is interesting because she's a baby. She just had, like, let's say she is permanently a year old because we saw her have her first birthday in the previous episode. So let's just say, like, you know, Arthur's always going to be eight. DW's always going to be four. Let's say Kate is always one. Yeah, she's Maggie Simpson. Let's, yeah. So I really don't think that babies have, like, object permanence at this point. Like, Like, the whole crux of this episode is that Kate wants a balloon, and she remembers that she wants a balloon, and she wants it so bad she cannot stop crying. And I don't think, like, she's obviously, I think I think it's more of a thing of, like, she's really smart for her age. Because she's, like, got this incredible memory for what she wants. And, like, she ha- already has displays, like, object permanence. Yeah, like, this episode, and I think more than others, really requires you to dis- uh, suspend your disbelief. Because there's a lot of things that happen in this episode. And, of course, we're talking about Arthur. Outlandish stuff happens all the time. There's imaginary friends. Magical realism, Um, yada, yada. yada. But for some reason, it just didn't work for me, this episode. I had trouble suspending Mm. my disbelief. There's a lot of things that happen in this episode that I kept saying this would never happen. And also, even more uh, frequently, people reacted to certain things in this episode that made no sense to me. And I thought about like how people would actually react to things in this episode, in this situation in real life. Right. And it, it, the way some people deal with the problems that are put on display in this episode is crazy. Well, we got, well, we have one right now because people are trying to figure out why Kate's crying. You know, is it this, is it that? And then Buster says, I know what she wants, a bite of pizza, and puts his pizza slice in her lap and then Kate immediately just upends it onto the street. Like, you get what you deserve, Buster, you ninny. Like, what did you expect? You Now you got now you wasted a slice of pizza because you thought a baby wanted pizza. Also, she'd I'd probably mean, choke on no, it if you didn't cut in a little No pieces. sympathy. No sympathy. This is incredible. This is, this is sub-Buster levels of dumb. He kind of gets the fact that Kate wants a balloon. And then he kind of... 
put, puts it in front of her and then like squeaks the air out of it. This is such a good shot too because it's um, a, yeah. you could see Kate's reflection in the balloon as it's deflating. And she's incredibly dismayed because he's like <laughs> he's deflating the balloon which is against the whole point and of course making a horrid noise as well and just like what in the like Buster's oh speaking of oh for something Buster's oh for two here like what are what were you thinking? Yeah, I thought he was going to inhale the helium and make a funny voice or, to or, try and make her happy. That seems like something Buster would do, but or, no, he just kind of lets the lets the air out, and which makes matters only worse. So Pal is the only one who understands that Kate wants the balloon, and this is the entire struggle of the episode is that nobody else is getting it, which, you know, as you say, you have to be able to suspend your disbelief a little bit. Well, that's another thing that frustrated me about this episode is it's one of those cases where the audience immediately knows the solution to the problem. Pal knows that Kate wants the balloon, and that's kind of the joke of this episode. Sometimes, like, the adults and the other characters will almost guess what pa- Kate yeah. wants, and it's like, oh, they're so stupid. The dog's the only one that figured it <laughs> it's, out. It's, it's, a real, it's a real idiot plot, as Roger Ebert would say. It yeah. relies on everybody except the main character being Pal being idiots. And I get that that's, like, the joke, but I also I just kind of found it frustrating. Like, I found it more annoying than I did funny. All right. Dad's solution for right now is that Kate wants Arthur to push her, which... Who cares? Uh, and so he gets DW to uh, take Pal's leash. And DW has a great line here of just like trying to help of like, maybe she's sitting on a bee. If I were sitting on a bee, I'd cry. And I'm just like, yeah, I would too. You're not wrong. Not wrong. Uh, so Pal manages to escape because he is a very smart dog. He kind of wraps himself around like a lamppost and then like wriggles out of his wriggles out of his leash. And uh, so then that's the whole other part of the episode is that Pal's looking for a balloon for Kate and Arthur and Buster are looking for Pal because he's obviously escaped. Your uh, DW calls him your goofy dog, <laughs> like goofy, dopey, all this kind of stuff you were talking about. When they first realize Pal is missing, yes. Arthur is like really upset about the whole thing. Yeah, for sure. He's, of, because of course you would be. As someone who has lost their dog before, it's a horrifying experience. And Pal is Arthur's world, basically. It, it, exactly. It's his best friend, as he said many times. His best non-human friend. Right. Um, Don't question it. Well, we get some more of that later in this episode. <laughs> some, some questions to be asked. <sighs> but... Uh, DW, I get that she doesn't like Pal, but I thought it was really weird how like unconcerned she is about In, the whole situation. Almost, almost insensitive. Uh, totally. Like I thought the whole thing was, you know, Pal gets on DW's nerves, but she kind of loves him deep down. That's not on display here. She doesn't care that he's gone. She's like, oh, your dog got lost because it's an idiot. I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that she necessarily loves him deep down. Like she, like she thinks he's. Like, okay. Like, but it's still, but I'll grant you, it still seems kind of weird that she's being uh, kind of maybe a little too insensitive, especially near the end of the episode when Arthur's feelings are really hurt. And Arthur's parents, they're trying to be calm, cool, and collected as well. They say, okay, you guys go look for Pal. You can meet us back here at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. But I put myself in that exact situation, and, like, that's not how my parents would react. I get that Pal is Arthur's dog and not necessarily the family dog. Yes. But, like... A dog goes missing, especially during, like, a crowded street festival. All hands on deck, baby. We got to get that coverage. We got to find this dog. Because it's first 48. The longer you go without finding the dog, the harder it is to find the dog. But, no, I'm going to disagree with you here. Because Dad's reasoning is that they wanted to find a place where they can sit down, like, pretty much establish home base. Because Mom and Dad aren't going anywhere. They've got a screaming baby and they don't know what's wrong. That's true. They do have to take care of Kate, so they need which to, is the it factor They need here. to sit down. They need to get her out of the weather. They need to like maybe have a bite to eat, get her something to eat if she's hungry. She isn't, but it, just in case, like just do all the steps and then also have a place where Arthur and Buster can bring them so they're not so they don't lose each other while they're looking for Pal. I agree that establishing a home base is totally important because then everybody gets lost. But I also think one of the parents could have split off. We, we could... Mm. One of the parents can take care of Kate. I, uh, it ain't no thing. Eh, I don't know about that. She's she is crying an awful long time. So I think backup would be absolutely appreciated from the parents. At one point, they pass by like dog like dogs in cages from like I don't know maybe like the local pet store or something. And then like why don't you just get a new dog and points out a poodle? Just like he looks intelligent. He'd never get lost. And it's like ew a poodle yuck. Girl, yeah, they, they, but like Arthur kind of goes Bleh, like yeah, they go like Ugh. Um, throughout this episode. Pal has some really great 
reaction faces. Mm-hmm. There's a great, there's a great one when he like sees balloons, but then he sees like kids holding them, and he <laughs> like it's like he he's a real. So if Arthur's Ferris Buellering, uh, Pal is Jim Halperting all over the place. Like he is just reacting to the camera, and it's great. Like it's just very very expressive animations. Uh, well, it's, to, it's the only way they can really get Pal to communicate. No, right? but so. and, and it's very effective, and yeah. uh, so. He finally finds he tracks down Pickles the clown. Does Pal, and we find out that Pickles is allergic to dogs. So Pickles has like a police officer get Pal out of there. You know, bring him to the Lost and Found or something. Animal hierarchy time. The oh, police okay. officer that brings do- Pal to the Lost and Found is himself a dog. A dog. We have this bizarre <laughs> image of this cop dog, not yep. from the film, carrying. Another dog, but this dog isn't sentient, except he is, but he can't talk and walk on his hind legs. Again, we're looking way too far into this than anybody should be. Number one, take a shot. Number two, we're never going to be able to answer this question. There is no good answer. There is no clear answer. Well, this is really weird, though, because at first I thought, like, they had established, okay, just, there's there's no bipedal snakes in the Arthur universe. Snakes are just going to be the dumb animals for now. They're never going to be one of the smart ones. And I had thought, I guess, foolhardy, like, foolishly, that dogs were also in that category. But now we see, so there is dogs that are aware of it's the same thing of when Bionic Bunny apparently came from a bunny that was yeah. in a cage yeah, through yeah. what was what was the what radical they animal husbandry. Yeah, radical animal husbandry. So maybe maybe that's what this cop dog was the product of. I I completely it it flew over my head that it was a dog, but you but that he was a dog. But you're absolutely right. Like that's just, that is really weird. <laughs> Speaking of dogs, uh, it's announced that there's a lost dog at town hall, and Arthur immediately assumes it's Pal. So they go and see it, and it is like this like shriveled looking Chihuahua. And they both also give a reaction. Both of the Chihuahua and Arthur give this like rack <laughs> reaction to the camera. Like neither of them are impressed with what they see, which I think is great because if it was just Arthur and Buster going Bleh, at the Chihuahua, I'd be like, "That's kind of mean." That Chihuahua was actually yeah. kind of pretty cute looking. But the fact that the Chihuahua was like, "I'm not cool with these two either," is pretty funny. Yeah, uh, and I like the design on the Chihuahua. See. So at this point, the search to pals actually kind of – they're getting close to the end of the search, right? Yeah. And I just want to comment on – again, this is another problem I had with the episode, another piece of dissonance I have with this episode where I get that they're trying to keep the whole thing lighthearted. But there is sort of this wacky music playing in the in the background during this montage of them looking for pal. Yeah. And I think that – my feelings on how that situation plays out is so different than that emotion. Mm-hmm. Like, again, it's like, to me, a lost dog is like a lost family member. It's a really sad experience. Well, and it's a really it's a really desperate feeling experience. Like, I don't feel like it's like, we got to find the dog. Where could he be? Well, see, now it's the- like, I've lost my family member and I want to get him back. Well, see now, that, see, now that you mentioned it, it's like you said being ahead of the characters in terms of the story is that we know pal isn't like lost. He's not going to stay lost. He's smart enough to know, like he's a smart dog. He basically thinks like a human, but is just a dog. So we know that he's not running away. He's running away for a purpose and he's going to like fulfill that purpose. And it's not like, because at one point Arthur has real anxiety about this because you know, he he and Buster are kind of searching and he stops Buster. He's like, Hey, do you think maybe, Pal ran away because he doesn't like me anymore, and like Arthur's like his heart's breaking, and it's uh, but but of course of course not of course Pal yeah. still loves Arthur like it's just weird now that you mention it to like to be ahead of them in the story like I can't it's hard it's hard for me to shake this and of course Buster being a good friend immediately changes the subject because it's like <laughs> it's like let's not even think about that right now like obvious and obviously no merit to that uh, we we at one point cut back to kate in the restaurant and like it's a whole thing of like she sees the balloon stops crying then immediately stops crying like you said about having a hard time um suspending disbelief i guess i had a bit of an easier time but this is one of the points where i was like babies wouldn't cry for this long and then uh, uh, okay babies can cry for a very long time my sister and my brother-in-law can tell you that like their my niece has cried apparently like Hours and hours. Babies can cry for a long time. But this is – it's not because – like they, they literally rule out all the options. She's not tired. She's not hungry. She doesn't, have a, she doesn't have a messy diaper. None of that stuff. She's just crying over balloon. This wouldn't happen. Well, unless 
it, the baby was sick, which is what the parents assume um, sure. after this restaurant. Which, which you would have to because – why else? But also, but again, the whole the whole crux of this episode is completely ludicrous. A baby wouldn't like cry over a missing like balloon. Like you said, no object permanence. That balloon's gone, out of sight, out of mind. It's on to the rest of pooping and sleeping and yep, other baby pretty stuff. Much. And so yeah, that's I think if that's she, if she were like two or three, maybe. It, totally. Like as a toddler, this episode makes total sense. Yeah. But for a newborn baby, I, I think this is why this episode kind of doesn't work for me in particular. Yeah, because like by the time that Kate is like taken home, she's been crying for like an hour. And it's just it doesn't doesn't gel with me. Uh, we do get a brief return of Buster Baxter private eye. He's kind of asking uh, Miss Tingley like. If she see if he can look in her bag, it's like, can I look in your bag, ma'am? So just nice little ah, using those private eye skills. Arthur's got like a Polaroid of Pal. Which yes, I don't know where he produced that from. <laughs> like especially, it's like a shot from the back. That's of him, right, like, running away. So I, I wrote this down. It's useless because it's a shot from the back of Pal. It's yeah. not like if you were. If someone, if a person went missing, yeah. you'd be like, I guess dogs are different colors, so that's more helpful. They have different fur types. You can tell by breed. But, like, you would show their face. But this is literally a shot of, like, Pal's butt with him kind of looking yeah, backwards. Yeah. Not the best shot to put on the back of a milk cart. Definitely not. At this point, mom and dad are just like, we need to get Kate home. She might be sick. And then, like, they'll take care of her and then bring Arthur and Buster back and make up some lost dog signs as well. And as they're going home, Arthur actually runs into Pal. And pals of two minds, like, because he can see the balloons in the distance, and he also kind of looks at Arthur, and he looks back at the balloons, and, and Arthur's, like, elated. He's like, you found me! And then we get the moment where Pal runs away from him, and it's like, Arthur, you can just hear the heartbreak in his voice. He's like, he ran away from me. What did I do wrong? And then on, and then on the drive back, and I think this is where I really came into the thing of just, like, DW maybe being a little too insensitive, of just, like, Arthur, has, his head is in his hands next to, next to Kate, who's still crying, and he's just like, he hates me. And I'm just like, I, like, I wanted to give him a hug. I felt so bad for him because that's so not what was going on. And it's just, like, d- distressing in a way. I'm just mm-hmm. like, no, that's not, no. And, and like, because I, you know, you know, as as someone who deals with anxiety on a daily basis, like I totally understood this feeling, and I just wanted to be like, no, that's that's not what's happening. But of course, and of course, everything wraps up okay. But I I guess I related to how Arthur was feeling, but you know, not necessarily for a dog when it comes to myself. But I understand because you know we we've said before in the previous episodes, in the last one, it's like Arthur, the pal is Arthur's whole world, and it's it's hard to see him go through this. At what point, uh, kind of, Arthur runs into Francine and Muffy, and then they also run into Pal, who is kind of on his way, and they're kind of in in the story and then out of it. Uh, Pal finds, like, the bunch of balloons. Um, Before we say yo, goodbye to Francine and Muffy, I just want to point out that, like, Muffy is still horrible. Like, I'm waiting for the episode where we get a little bit more oh. of Muffy's character, because at this point, like... She is really just terrible. I don't remember exactly what she says. Well, but she, she's well, like she, she keeps saying that like that dog is so rude. I told you he was a rude dog. Like really one. He's, she's really one note in this episode. But like she's been one note like as a whole like this whole series so far. I keep I I, I can't wait till we get to see a little bit more from Muffy. Yeah. Because right now she's like terrible. I don't dis- I don't disagree. There's not been a lot of depth to her. Um. So Pal goes to, like, get Pickles' um, bunch of balloons. He does this sweet bounce into, like, a sunset flip uh, to, like, get the balloons as they're in the air. And there's this whole, like, minute-long gag of him hanging from the balloons. Well, not not even really a gag of just, like, it's like a... It's like mi- a set piece. Yeah, it's like a mini chase scene almost because Francine and Muffy are on foot and they're trying to get Pal to get down for the balloons. And Pal just wants one. And eventually he falls with the balloon, and Francine catches him, and he's right. Off. And it's like it starts off as a bundle, but like one by one, balloons yeah, start floating just, away, they, and unravel. of course he starts to uh, lose height, and so eventually there's one balloon, and then he floats. Down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Pal finally gets a balloon, and then he rushes home. Uh, we cut back to the Reed house. It's like Arthur in the middle, uh, like right about to make a lost dog sign. Like he puts the marker to the paper, and he puts it down. And this, and again, this is so so depressing. Just like. Why, do, why make lost dog signs if he doesn't want to come home? If that's what he wants, I want him to be happy. And it's just like, 
unbelievably sad. Like, like as I was seeing it, like I'm so invested, like more in Pal as a character, but also in Arthur and Pal's relationship because mm-hmm. I think that that's really like one of my favorite parts of the show so far. Interesting. And like seeing like and it, it kind of made this is what made me realize it of just like seeing Arthur apart from Pal. It's just like it's not it's not it's not right. And it was it was a very interesting way of showing the the depth of what Pal means to Arthur. Um see and this is another point where I had a little bit of dissonance with it because like I understand that this is, of course, how Arthur would perceive the situation. You know, he's sort of applying these characteristics to Pal that aren't there. He thinks that yep. the reason Pal's left is because he, he doesn't love because, Arthur because anymore. He, because Arthur did something wrong. Right. But uh, th- I had a problem with it because I'm, again, a part of the audience, so I know that's not true. Right. So though I felt for Arthur and his struggle, I was also frustrated. It, I compare it to, like, when you watch those really bad Adam Sandler or Kevin Smith movies – uh, not Kevin Smith, Kevin James. Thank you. Uh, Kevin James movies where, like, there's a part where someone has to lie to their family. And yeah. so the whole crux of the movie or, is they're lying yeah. to their family the whole time. And then you have that frust- like, And it's like you know they're going to get back together in the last yeah, – like, you, yeah, know yeah, yeah. you know it's not going to last. I felt, more, I felt more frustrated than I did engaged with okay. what was going on emotionally. Okay. DW finds Pal at the door and Pal bounds in and – of course, Arthur's overjoyed. They both chase him upstairs. Pal jumps into Kate's uh, crib where she's still crying, gives her the balloon, and then immediately stops. Like, she's totally happy. Uh, so, And then, of course, Arthur is just like, he likes me again. And <laughs> like a dad comes in, uh, and he, like, takes earplugs out. I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> at, that, at that point, you would pretty much have to. And then he's like, how did you get Kate to stop crying? And mom's like, I don't know. I guess we'll never know what was we'll bothering never Kate. Know. And, then, and then Pal gives one more great Jim Halpert face. Okay, so that's the end of the episode. Great, great face by Pal takes us out. All right, what did you what did you think of, of these two? You know what? I actually found myself, I didn't really like either of these episodes. Okay. Uh, the first one, I thought every time we flash, I liked the gag of – something getting added to Arthur's base story every time. Yep. And so every time we saw a piece of the new rewritten story, I enjoyed those moments. Mm-hmm. But everything in between I thought was really bland. I thought the animation in between those moments is like was really stiff uh, and almost motion tweeny, even though I know it's hand-drawn. Uh, I also thought that, like, I don't know, like, I, I, I just... I could see where that story was going a mile away, and it's a similar problem with the second episode as well. Yeah. I was just so disconnected with the whole narrative because there were so many logical leaps I had to make. Like, okay, so this baby wants this balloon. The dog knows the baby wants the balloon. The dog's going to get the baby the balloon, and also the baby won't stop crying. And then uh, there was just too many logic leaps I had to make. And also I just – I don't know. In my mind, do- missing dog and baby that won't c- stop crying, if I was to put those two in a bar graph, the missing dog bar in terms of importance is like a little bit higher than the baby that won't stop crying. And so that was something like I thought about the time my dog went missing and how just like viscerally upset. How old, uh, how old were you? Oh, this was like recently because I've only oh. – yeah. So like I remember – uh, basically what had happened was it was an open door situation. So it wasn't like we were out and about, like the dog yeah. ran out the door and kind of into the woods. Mm. And this was like, all right, dad's coming home from work. I'm literally sprinting down the street. My little sister is sprinting down the street in the other direction. We're trying to get as much ground game here as possible. Wow. Trying to like, like, cause again, I can't stress this enough. It's a Part of your family's missing. It's like yeah. if there was a kid that ran away. Sure. It's, it's And again, I have to preface this with, obviously, I'm not the intended age for this episode. No. So and uh, it's, I'm and sort of bringing myself into it a little too much, and that's why it's not working for well, me. Well, and it's, and, it's, and it's harder for me to relate to that because I've never had a dog. And I'm not really an animal person, so I – understand I, – I, I can only understand to a point when people are just like, my dog is a part of my family. And I'm like, okay. Like, mm-hmm. that'll never be it. Like, I'll never understand that. So when you said, like, crying baby versus missing dog, my first thing was, no, crying baby. Because mm-hmm. it's like, baby is human. So it's just like – that's just my thing. It's it's I totally understand to a point what you're getting at. And 
that's just what means more to you. So I, I, I get what you're saying. And I think that that's – I mean I kind of brought some of my own personal stuff into that second episode. So I think it, I, it's okay. We're kind of supposed to – we're supposed to do that. So uh, – but it didn't it didn't work in that respect for you. So. Some great jokes in these two episodes though. Yeah. Uh, I remembered um, – the one thing I remembered from that second episode is short, sort of when it's showing all of the vendors. Yes. There's this great gag where the bank – the guy from the bank's like, free giveaways, free giveaways, and everybody crowds around the bank because yeah. they think they're going to give away money. Or something. And, and then the guy's like, we got pens with the bank's logo on them. Pencils. Uh, pencils. And so the crowd disperses like, very quickly. Anybody? <laughs> Nobody wants a pencil. I love that. I love that banker guy. He's the MVP of this episode. That, that, that was a good. That was, that was Him good. And, and Pickles the Clown. The characterization of Pickles the Clown is kind of crazy because not only does he is he allergic to dogs, but he sort of is this sad clown character where he's like, "Please, dog, yeah. please go away, get away." Like he just like, seems depressed. He, he seems yeah. He seems, <laughs> he seems a little pathetic in that sense. Okay, so. The first episode, Arthur writes a story. I kind of thought was another one of those bare bones ones. I thought that I kind of judged from the way it was animated. Like I think these are obviously done in different teams, but it seemed like it was done maybe earlier in the production schedule because the animation style is a little less refined. Uh, the characters are a little, uh, you know, what I don't want to say if they're on model or not because I don't, I don't really know what I'm saying with that. So, but they don't really look themselves in some of the shots so I feel like it was kind of early on into the series maybe in the production schedule yes I'm not crazy about the look of it I think when they get into like the I don't so much like it as an episode but I do appreciate how imaginative they got with it I appreciate how they were able to kind of get a little bit more get a little bit more out there with the uh with the imagination sequences of like really making it its own thing. They're having their own kind of weird magic, magical realism style about it. The and, imagery is really fun. Yeah. Though I'll say I hated that they used that old footage. I really didn't like that. I, yeah. And now, of course, that's exemplified by us watching these in order. Yeah. Of course, in syndication, you wouldn't notice that. I'm sure as a kid watching this like week to week, you probably wouldn't remember that. But I, I really – that really turned me off. I, I understand. And it was – like I didn't really like it either. It was just like, okay, here's a minute of the episode gone pretty much. So, you know, good but not great – it, I mean, I you know what? Not maybe not even good. I say it's it's fine. Like I don't know if I go back to it, but there's 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 some there's some fun things in there that I thought uh, I'm sure that the the people making it really appreciated being a part of. That song like, is really like good. like getting to record that country song. I bet was probably a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so the second episode when I after I watched it, I thought that I really liked it. Like I thought almost that I was going to say it was one of my favorites of the season, but. Talking it out with you, like, I'm starting to agree with you more, to be honest with you. Like, I think what I really liked about the episode was more of, like, the imagery. And by the imagery, I mean, like, I th- again, I'm kind of I'm kind of a mark for pal. Like, You're a I th- sucker for that pal face. I am. I really am. And, like, I I think that the animation in it was really good. I think that they te- do visual storytelling very well, and that's true with pal. I think that he's a very good representation of how good their animation team is because they – are able to tell stories with no with no dialogue, just purely through Pal, and I think that that's a real strength. I like Pal. I like Kate. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good characters in here and all that sort of thing. And I think I was just like, I think I just like the overall the story, like you said earlier in Macro, of just like Pal goes missing and then he gets him back. Just kind of like the emotional through line of it. I think I responded to more. But hearing you talk about like as a story, it doesn't add up. You have to like assume like you already know more than the characters and this sort of thing. I don't think, I think I don't think it's very well put together. And there's also no moral to that episode. No, and, and they no. Arthur episodes don't necessarily need a moral, but it seemed kind of pointless. Yeah, especially considering like the thread that it was built on, which is like Kate wants a balloon, and that's already pretty tenuous to begin with. So. <laughs> Uh, I think I kind of agree with you. I don't know if I would call it bad because I still like the, I still like the parts of it that I like, but it's definitely not not as strong as some of the episodes that we've already watched. So I I, I end up kind of agreeing with you where I didn't think I necessarily would. So you know, uh, overall, not 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 a super winner of a of a of an episode altogether. The two of them, but you know, they're, it's a long it's a long tenured series. So there's gonna be there's gonna be ones that aren't 
going to hit. And at least we're old enough now that we can kind of recognize when one doesn't work. I like what you said about you could tell the difference between the animation style. It's like when there's uh, when a Call of Duty game comes out one year and you're like, oh, this is a Treyarch year. Or it's yeah. like, oh, this is the Infinity War yeah, game. Exactly. All right, so there it is. Arthur writes a story and Arthur's lost dog. What did you think of this episode? We would love to hear from you. Real quick, here's a couple of the ways that you can not only get in touch with us, but also support us. We really love to hear from you. And that's what spurs us onward is getting reactions and uh, responses from you. So here are the ways that you can do it. You can go to Facebook, facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits. You can go on over there. Give us a like. Uh, We're putting up uh, announcements about the show, uh, images from the show, and all that fun stuff. You can find us on Twitter, at ECL Podcast. Also putting up images from the show over there, retweeting those memes, all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, I actually, this week, put up, speaking of Facebook, an article about, it was like an interview with Mark Brown with the Huffington Post, talking about the year that we've had the importance of Arthur going on 20 years. I thought it was a really good read and, uh, you know, a little bit more on the serious side, but you know, I th- if you're really interested in Arthur, this is something you'll definitely want to check out. And that's on our Facebook. If you want to get in touch with us, the best way to do it is by emailing us, elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. And if you send us in an email, we will read it on the air. So if you have questions, concerns, uh, or, and unless it's like you know criticism about the podcast, which you can absolutely send in, probably won't read that on the air, but we will read it, absolutely. And finally... One of the best ways you can support us is, of course, to listen. You can find us on SoundCloud, Elwood City Limits on SoundCloud, and perhaps most importantly, on iTunes. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Please write a review, share, uh, subscribe on iTunes, and uh, give us a rating. Now, I'm going to say... I think I'm going to do away with reading the reviews on iTunes. I think that's a little maybe self-congratulatory, but we will what we will do is we'll we'll acknowledge your we will acknowledge you here on the podcast and of course you'll get a big thank you from us. We have 8 five-star ratings on there. You don't have to rate us five stars, but we would really appreciate your honest feedback in all of these ways. Facebook, Twitter, email, and of course, iTunes and SoundCloud. Yeah, Thank- and leaving a review on iTunes does help us out a lot. The the algorithm, the robot that yep. decides what podcasts get shown to people, that's all based on the iTunes reviews. So even mm-hmm. if you give us whatever star rating you think we deserve, uh, it's very helpful to rate and uh, write a little review blurb. Simply put, your feedback is what keeps us going. So please, don't be shy. We would really love to hear from you. Lucas, next week... We're going to be back at it with another pair of episodes. I'm going to... This isn't a spoiler because we haven't watched them yet. But one of these episodes, I think, might be the worst of the season. (laughs) Interesting. So next week, we're going to be watching, and hopefully you'll be watching along with us, So Long Spanky and Buster's New Friend. I'm very excited. All right. Me too. Uh, Lucas, any parting words for us? (laughs) Rotten. That's Lucas Mancini, uh, the Frogmeister himself. Frog Fractions 2. That's right. The man. Have, they found it. Apparently, they're on the they're on the case. And it's rotten. And for Frog Fractions 2, Kiss Mancini, I am Will Young. 